You're listening to Combat Radio with Ethan Dettenmeyer, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. The truth is out there, soon to be the truth is out there too, but also the Chill Pack Hollywood Hour. Producer Phil Lairness, myself, Ethan, with Combat Radio, and the legend Jack O'Halloran, who we all know and love. Yay. Not just for his work, iconic work in the Superman movies, but you worked with a friend of mine, director Dick Richards. Oh, yeah. In, Dick Farrell, my lover. Yeah, oh, also, yeah, but, but yeah, March or die, die, the French Foreign Legion film, yeah. which honestly is probably the best acting, well, not just the acting I've seen in that film is yours, but some of the work is just unbelievable. How was it working with that guy? With uh, Terrence Hill? Or yeah. Terrence Hill, the Italian kid? Yeah, because English wasn't his first language. No. In fact, that was the very first movie he ever did in English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? And, and some would say that wasn't even in English. And he was, uh, he, was, he, was, he, was he was kind of a funny kid because he was like a, a real method guy, you know? Yeah. And, and we're doing a shot with him. One day, and, and every shot he was in, he and I were beside each other. I, they had me stationed next to him, everything he did. I love so how he's they in, do it. We're, we're at the, at the sand the here. And, and all these Arabs are coming down the hill, supposedly to wipe us out. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're going to get killed, right? So the camera's sitting right here, and, and the, I'm here, and he's there next to me. And, uh, and, and he looked at me, and he said, I can't do this. I said, what do you mean you can't do this? He said, well, there's no, is it, is like, yeah, too far? Yeah, let's move you up, let's move you up, Jack. Okay. The, uh, you're too big, you're like nine feet tall. That's right. So when you sit back in a chair, you're in the other side of the convention hall. So they, they uh, he, you know, he, um, he looked at me, he said, I can't do this. I said, what do you mean you can't do this? He said, well, they want me to react to, to, to we're at death's door. He said, and, and, and I don't see anybody coming at me. <laughs> I said, um, you know, that's what they pay us for to act. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so acting is all about. Right? So you're telling, you know, you're, you're telling. You're supposed to put a reaction into the camera here, son. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and he said, oh, well, uh, you know, you know, just, I, I can't, you know, I'm having a hard time. <laughs> so he, he, he did one scene. He's on the boat. Did you ever see the movie? Oh, I, I know that movie all too okay. well. It's one of he's my on, favorites. He's on the boat when they catch him. He was having this affair with Catherine. Right, Catherine Deneuve. Yeah. yeah. And they and they catch him, and Hackman catches him. And he brings him out in front of him, and, and he's he's got a, a glass of uh, some kind of drink, and he's making him drink it. Right. So, you know, if you're doing a shot, you're going to do it a lot of times, so you yeah. take a sip or whatever. No, this kid's got to drink the whole thing down because he said, I got to feel it, like <laughs> that I'm drunk. He said, I can't just, I, I just can't, I mean, seriously. Wow. I got to feel it. So Hack was standing there and he said, okay. So after about the fifth glass of this stuff, he's pumping down his throat. And of course, you know, they, they, they mix his stuff in it to make it. He goes to deliver a line to Gene and out comes the fountain of youth. Whoop. Just puked all of it. Oh, <laughs> oh, nice. You know, Hackman just stood there and said, Method acting, huh? Yeah. That, now, that, that's Larry. interesting, because that's not the only time you worked with Gene Hackman. Obviously, it was Lex Luthor. Yeah. But in, for the movie we're talking about, uh, March or Die, you yeah. played uh, sort of an old czar, the guard of the last czar. Oh, the last czar. Yeah. And uh, they were killed. On, I don't The back story, relatively, is they were killed when you weren't there. I was there. on the lunch. I was on lunch. You were on break. lunch. The czar's <laughs> killed. And you wow, search the country be. for them, can't find them, but end up joining the Foreign Legion. Yeah. But you Out are so remorse. Yes, but you are so convincing in that movie that I remember as a kid, I actually cried when you were killed. Uh, I, is that a spoiler alert? I, I have my friend, uh, remember Bill Smith, the actor? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, uh, he speaks Russian fluently. Uh huh. So I used to sit down with him in the afternoon. I said, I have to put this Russian accent together, man, for this part I'm doing in March or Die. And I, I could still, I, I mean, I did it so much. I should have been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, had to, I, had to, I had to whip up an, a, a Russian accent, man. I said, you know, Trade. Let's trade the stance. You know what? Hold on. Oh, there it is. There's a pro. That's what we like. So, you know, when you're doing stuff like that and you get the mannerisms and all, and I had a lot of fun. I mean, there's such great actors on that movie. I mean, Jesus, Marcel Bazooki was on it. Yeah. Max and Sidow. 
But it was it was it was a great film. Yeah. It was sad. It was prob the problem was Dick Richards. Dick Richards shot four hours of picture. Yeah. And how do you cut a 20, 20 minutes out of four hours? Yeah. yeah. So it had a lot of dead ends. And there's a lot of European actors that became big actors that were in that thing. Yeah. And he, the French kid, and uh, a couple of Marcel Bazooka was in it. And, uh, they say, so the, if you ever see the television version, it's it, a four-hour version. Yeah, it's oh, a two-parter. Wow. I remember oh, two-parter. Two well, yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, I yeah. saw oh, it. Yeah, it was like well. the NBC movie of the week. Oh, and no, it was it works two really nights. really good, though. Yeah. Oh, no, it works good. So turns... We're doing a shot where these guys are escaping from the French Foreign Legion, and, and he's got to shoot them. Yeah. Right? So he the cameras right there with uh, plexiglass across it because they're shooting blanks, but you know what the hell. <laughs> so Terrence says, no, nope, not enough power. I don't feel like I'm really shooting anybody. Oh, no. I said, what? So they kept loading up. Bigger charges. The charges. And the poor camera guy is like right where you are. He blew the whole face off the camera. Wow. And the director said, did you get enough charge out of that turn? Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm going to move back. I right know. You know. I thought the camera guy wanted to kill him. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> that scene actually is only in, well, there's a scene. I guess there's it's a, only the, in the television. Yeah, yeah and because what happens is the officers they don't shoot. They ultimately no. decide not to shoot yeah. their comrades, and the officer that's in charge feels he's not being obeyed and commits suicide. And I remember seeing that as a kid. Years later, I saw the movie on video. I said, "There's a scene missing here, where like an officer shoots himself." No, right. and, they, they, and, they did the shot of shoot the guys. Yeah, but great ending to that movie. Great, oh, yeah. uh, no, one of the best actually, endings. It was, a, it was brilliantly shot. Great cinematography. Yeah, and and. The, the, Everybody just gets so. We worked on that film for six months. Wow, where was it shot? We shot it in. Uh, we were in Morocco. Oh yeah. We were in Spain. We went to Morocco, and then Gene Hackman hurt his hip falling off a horse, so we had a break and we came home, and then we went out to Arizona, to uh, to pick up the shot. Oh, you kidding? And they couldn't match the sand. I would think that's hard. So they had to bring sand. <laughs> So you shot flew, part of that movie in Arizona last, and it flew sand yeah, in? one just... What scene? What scene is in Arizona? Close it was, in. Uh, when we were, um, we were... We were all gathering up to go. The camels and everything were getting ready to march through the desert. It was like pickup shots. Oh, okay. Wow. The fort, though, that was built over in that Tunisia? Was over, oh, yeah. The fort was over in And do you ever think, like, dude, I'm doing, like, a modern-day version of Bo Jest. I'm, like, uh, I'm in a classic. Well, you know, it was great. We, we were doing the film over there, and we got in, into Morocco, and we, uh, the guy, the guy who owned the desert that we were <laughs> shooting on, yeah. we went to his house to have dinner, and he, the guy was a, a king, he was a real friend of the king's. Uh-huh. Had no education, but he owned that desert, a couple of hotels. In fact, the hotel we were staying in. And it was the first time I saw Farewell, My Lovely in French. Yes. At his private theater. The, okay, oh, wow. if I, I'm so glad he brought it up because I was so scared that I was never going to get another question about another movie into this interview with Jack. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. And Jack, you played one of my favorite uh, characters in all of literature, Moose Malloy, oh, yeah. in yeah. Farewell, My Lovely. Yeah. Was that your first movie? First movie. You're kidding. Look my at you. Movie. Right yeah. out of the gate, and yeah. you're yeah. this Straight great part. And with, Bob, with Robert Mitchum. Never had been on a set before in my life. Wow. And uh, How did you get that? Robert Mitchum. Well, they, they came to me. They had been coming to me to do movies since 1968. And uh, Is that when you retired from boxing? I retired from boxing in 75. Oh, in oh, 75. Wow. And okay. I did, in 74. And I did okay. farewell in 75. In fact, they, they, they flew me out here to do The Great White Hope. Right. With James Earl Jones, which is a great story. They, Eddie Foy, the third, put this together with some friends of mine from the East Coast. They were trying to get me off the street. So I came out here, and I just knocked out Manuel Ramos in the forum. He was ranked number one in the world. <laughs> and, and the producer, they fly me out to go to, and I sit down with the producer at 20th, and the guy says to me, it's all, and, and Gambino, the boxing trainer, comes in, he says, I'm your agent. He said, it's all put together. All you got to do is sign the agreements and tell me one plus ten. <laughs> I get paid. So I said, uh, yeah, well, let's listen to what the guy's got to say. 
So I'm sitting down with this producer and he says, we're going to send you to Spain for six months. You're going to really like this. He said, we're going to give you 1,500 or 2,000 a week. And he said, uh, he said, it's great. We're, we're really looking forward to you coming on and doing Jess Willard, you know, the, the fighter. Right. And I said, uh, you're going to send me to Spain for six months? He <laughs> said, yeah. I said, I just knocked out the number one ranked heavyweight in the world. And you're telling me I got to give up boxing? He said, uh, well, you know, for six months. And he said, I said, how much are you paying me? He said, uh, well, we, we got 1500 maybe we go 2000 I said, uh, I give that away in tips a week. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, there's a guy, and this game, you know, guy shit himself because they, <laughs> this was all put together by some people <laughs> from the East Coast to get me off the street. And, and he said, uh, I said, there's a guy named Beatty, Jim Beatty, who just retired from boxing, lives in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's a sweetheart of a guy. He's got six mouths to feed. Here's his phone number. Give him a call. <laughs> I'm sure. He said, you're telling me no? I said, well, you know, you're not really doing me any favors here. And, you know, maybe I'm not ready for this business yet. So I get up. Eddie Foy is sweating bullets. He's outside listening to this thing at the door. He said, you're going to get me killed. Are you going to get me killed? Yeah, well, yeah. well some serious a... people from the East Coast thought it would be a good idea if I got in the mood. Right. And, and I said, uh, I said, I ah, mean, I'll take care of the East Coast. Don't worry about it. I said, you know, so and I'm leaving Fox and I'm walking down the front steps of the, and here comes James Earl Jones walking up the front of the, of the building. And he looks at Jack O'Hara and I said, yeah, I said, James Earl Jones. He said, he said, yeah. He said, is it true the story I just heard about you? I said, Depends on what story it is. <laughs> he said, I heard you just told Hollywood to stick the biggest movie there being made, which was at the time, up their ass. They said, well, if you want to look at it that way, I got to <laughs> shake your hand. He said, I never met anybody. I that love did that it. Before. <laughs> and we became friends after that. And, and, and Steve McQueen was a good friend of mine because he came to Boston to do the Thomas Crown Affair. And uh, he and I, we looked after him and, and we became pretty good friends. He said, you got to come down to the set. He said, I'll get you a card. You come, I'll put you in the movie. You got to come to Hollywood. Man. We're going to hang out. We're going to have a ball. And I kept saying, no, no, no. And he called me up one day. He did the Towering Inferno. Right. And he said, how'd you like your name up on the screen? I said, what are you talking about? His name was Captain O'Halloran. Ah, nice. Oh. He said, he said, didn't you like the name? It sound good? He said, wouldn't you think it would be great? Get your ass out of here. Yeah. I said, no. <laughs> so then I was, I had retired from boxing, and I'm, uh, I own two construction companies in New Jersey. And uh, I get a phone call from a woman. I did a lot of commercials in San Diego when I was a California Edward champion. And she said, they want you to do a picture, Farewell My Lovely, with Robert Mitchell. I looked around this bar, and I said, you know what? I think it's time. I said, what am I going to do? She said, you got to go to the Sherry Netherlands and meet Dick Richards, the director. He said, you got to go up to Sherry Netherlands and meet the director. He wants to see you. Uh, I said, all right. So I had to go to Boston to do some stuff, and I come down, and I'm dressed in a, in a white suit with a dark blue shirt. Uh, gangster. <laughs> Don't gangster. <that. laughs> and I walk into, and I had a mustache at the time, and I walked into the Sherry Netherlands suite, and there's... Uh, Alex Karras and all these character actor guys sitting there you know, trying to get this role. And Dick Richards comes in and he said, you're the guy. You, come in here. Come in this room. Come in this room. And nice. He, he said, yeah. I started taking all these pictures. He said, you're, you're the guy. I'm telling you, you're going to do this role. I said, yeah, really? Right. You know, and he said, uh, I don't want to be insulted. He said, but under that mustache, you have a hair lip. I said, I'll give you a hair lip. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we go through this whole rigmarole. And, uh, and we go back and forth, back and forth. And, and I'm walking and he said, I promise you, you're the guy, I'm gonna call you in a couple of days, we'll fly you out to California. I'm gonna convince them you're the guy to do this picture. So I come out to the, he could follow me out to the, uh, the elevator and I said, you're not gay, are you? You get all these guys up here? And I said, so he said, no, no, he said, you're, I know all about you. He said, you're the guy. So I, they fly me out to do a screen test, Jerry Brookheimer, picks me up in his Volkswagen. Right, because he was the he was he, he was, was getting into producing. Picture, yeah. You know? And he picks me up in his Volkswagen and we go out to Richard Woodmark's house in Mandeville Canyon and we do we're gonna do the screen test. Harry Dean Stanton's there and uh, and I go through this whole thing of doing a screen test. And Harry Dean Stanton's helping me with the lines and stuff. 
And Robert Mitchum saw the screen test. He said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, said, good, wow that's good cachet, you know? Jack. So we, and he arranged to pick me up the first day of filming. And we went down to work together. And, and he had me laughing all the way down to the set. And uh, he said, uh, we got on the set. And we had to go down to 5th and Main. He said, go get in that monkey suit and I'll meet you over there. And I had never been on a sound set. I'd never been on the front of the camera. Other than do commercials. And he, um, we get over there and I get all dressed up. I'm standing there and he said, uh, have you uh, read this script, son? And I said, I know your role, my role. <laughs> Charlotte Rampling's role. I said, page for page, my boy. He said, good. Throw it in the trash can. And don't let me catch you doing like hundreds of people in this town acting. Just be yourself. He said, this is a gangster. You can do this just like you're walking down the street. And I said, uh, okay. <laughs> so we, we, okay. Get, we, we started this thing. And uh, he just walked me. He was magnificent. Yeah. He was, became like Sounds a father like. to me, man. He was yeah. great. Dude. It was a great loss when he died. And the film did very well. Great, great little movie. Right? Did so, you like working with Dick Richards since, since we both know him? I, you know, I liked it. Dick is a good guy. Yeah. But he was a commercial guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dick's career came to an abrupt halt. He wrote Tootsie. Tootsie right. he owned. He owned Tootsie. Yeah. And when he put Tootsie together, uh, Jessica was a good friend of mine because we did King Kong together. Right. And, uh, and when he put Tootsie together, Dustin Hoffman wanted to do the film. And Dick said, well, you know, I'm going to be directing it. And Dustin said, I don't think so. He said, you ain't directed me, sunshine. He <laughs> said, but I'll do the picture, but not you as a director. So Dick said he didn't give me. He just sat home collected a lot of money. Yeah, yeah exactly. he told me that actually Dustin Hoffman almost gave Pollock a heart attack on it because they were arguing all day, every day. Uh, so he Dustin, was, Dustin was a funny guy. He was, yeah. He's a good actor. He was, he was, but, you know, it's in, in Dick Richards' house, um, you may know, on his wall, there's a lot of March and Die photos, of, like from the set. Dick really good a, ones of you, Dick, too. Dick is a good guy. Yeah. Dick's, I mean, I haven't seen him in a while. I mean, we used to play tennis out of his house and everything. He bought Richard Woodmark's house. Well, is that, that right? First. I don't know if he's still there. In, in Mandible Canyon. Yeah. He was, uh, yeah, they had, <laughs> I did my screen test, uh, or no, and then I went up to get changed. And they had one other guy coming in, this big guy. And I said, well, this is no problem. I'll wait for him to come up here to get changed. I'll take him a walk around the house. I'll have a discussion with him. He'll say, I got to go home. And, and that's no problem. You know, fix you done. Because I told Brookhart when he picked me up, I said, I'm doing this movie. He said, well, you got to do a screen test. I said, son, I get on the plane. With the, I'm doing the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I watched this guy walk up and hand a box of candy to Dick Richards. I said, if that's what this is about, I'm out of here. You know? so, <laughs> How'd you like working with Donner? Oh, he was good. Was he? Don, yeah. Donner, Donner, Donner's a brilliant, brilliant director. Brilliant director. And did you like working with Terrence Stamp? Oh, yeah. 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 Terrence, Terrence is, a, is a real pro. Um, Terrence, Superman was like a revival. <laughs> we joining the birthday celebration? Yeah, no. Trying to avoid it. Can we have to blow out the it? candles now? Yeah, exactly. Can I hear it? No, can you hear him? <laughs> Should we stop? We'll just hold for a sec. Oh, we're going to hold for a sec. Is that Bruce Boxleitner? Yeah. I guess. We I did, we did the Baltimore thing. Bullet together. The what? The Baltimore Bullet. Great picture. I never heard of it. Baltimore Bullet? No. Great movie. Pool playing. We, we shot the actual nine ball tournament at MGM. No. Yeah. Moscone, everybody was there. And the, uh, Jimmy was, uh, it was his first movie. And Jimmy Coburn was in it. Omar Sharif was in it. Wow. Uh, How did I never hear this? Thing? Great oh, film. And a great film. I yeah. mean, really nice little picture. And Coburn and uh, Brock Sleitner were pool hustlers. Oh, really? And they question? were trying to hustle. If, if ja it, it, are we we're back? We're back from our break. We're back, we're back now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're back. Um, can, is it all right if I ask two boxing questions sure. of you? Uh, I was just curious because you fought so many greats. Yeah. What fighter that you faced did you respect the most? Is there any that just made you, after you faced them, you said, wow, this guy, win or lose? Margot I mean, Kidder? <laughs> She's pretty tough. Valerie Perrine. No. Yeah, Valerie. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I tell you, a guy, I had a fight with a guy, and uh, I beat a kid that was the uh, champ of Wales, Carl Gizzy. 
in uh, at the Grosvenor House in London, and he was a he was a great fighter. Yeah, Paul he was Gizzi. a great fighter, Carl Gizzy. He was a he was a superb boxer, and uh, and I beat him in a decision uh, in London. And were the boxing styles different uh, culturally, like from the UK to the? Well, American yeah, country? because it, it, in those days, it, as an American, if you went to England and you body punched, they would take points away from you. Oh. Uh, and for, when I fought Bugner, uh, I, I I beat Bugner. I mean, they, they they robbed us a quarter of a point decision. No one ever heard of that before in boxing. Yeah. And, and and I wasn't allowed to hit him in the body. They told me don't hit him in the body. And, they, and it was supposed to be a 10-round fight. We fought in Albert Hall. And it was supposed to be a 10-round fight. At the end of eight rounds, they stopped the fight. Mickey Duff said, That's, the fight's over. I said, what, what are you what? talking about? We got two more rounds. Ago. And Bugner was out on his feet. He, couldn't even, he didn't even know who I was. And they rang the bell, and they stopped the fight. I said, are you people nuts or what? <laughs> yeah. And they, uh, they got away with murder. And that quarter of a point decision, Harry Gibb was a, was a ref, and he's a famous ref over there. So when they fought Carl Gizzy, uh, we, we, you know, after the fight, he said to me, he come up, he ref that fight. He said, see, we don't rob you all the time, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and see, this is what's amazing because there was recently this Manny Pacquiao decision oh my that, God. you know, right? Yeah. And he so, got robbed so bad. And, so and, bad. But is, is boxing any more corrupt now than it ever was? You know, or? I, I, you know the sad part is, um, I hated to say, I, I mean, I know Manny, and, and Freddie Roach, I started with this kid. I had one, I had one fighter, one champion. I, I, I trained and managed a kid named Frankie Lyles, who was the super middleweight champion of the world in 1994. And that's how Freddie Roach got started. And um, I, you know, I, I, I used to go down and see Freddie with Pacquiao, and, and Pacquiao is such a complete fighter. And I, uh, when I watched that fight, I shook my head. I, I, you know, even Bradley himself at the end of the fight said, "Well, I gave it my all, but I know it's not enough." Exactly. Because he was beat, and he knew he was beat. And, and Pacquiao should have knocked him out, but he beat him thoroughly. Beat him. And for them to take a decision like that, um, the thing that bothers me the most is I, I got a feeling that Aram's involved, and 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 that's the saddest part, because. Pacquiao, I think, was going to pull away from Aram as a promoter mm -hmm. and fight Mayweather on his own. Oh. And I got a feeling that's where this came from. I think at the end of the day, it could come out to that. But it, 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 the Nevada Commission should have come in and said something ASAP. They should have come up and stood up and said, whoa, this is not on. But nobody said a word. And, uh, I, I mean, every person that I know that judged that fight at ringside, uh, every boxing commentator. Uh, I mean, Pacquiao won that fight by eight rounds. It was not even close. <laughs> wow. So for that kid to get a decision, and the one judge had it so much the other way, I said, what fight is he watching? Did you punch uh, your TV? Do you have like <laughs> yeah. that old boxer's reaction of, I want to punch things. I wanted to do worse than that. I wanted to go to Vegas and grab the guy. Yeah. Is that how you not. handle things, Jack? Are you still that way? No. Yeah. <laughs> just a country boy. Man. Come on. I just I have a book that I just wrote that we're getting ready to make the what? film of. I wrote a great book called Family Legacy because my father was a man called Albert Anastasia. Uh -huh. in New York. Mm. He ran a little company called Murder Incorporated. <laughs> he was uh, so I wrote this great book that. Uh, we're going up to see Francis Coppola this week, and hopefully we make a deal. And, uh, wow. Francis Coppola, huh? Good choice. Yeah. No, this is, this <laughs> nice is of a, you to help out these young kids, these yeah, emerging, filmmakers. emerging filmmakers. Yeah, right. Well, Way to throw a bone to Coppola is, so he can get his is, uh, career rebooted. This is another Godfather. Yeah, right. indeed. And, uh, and it's one of a trilogy. So we're getting ready to really tell some neat stories about truth. What we like to do is... You're listening to Combat Radio with Ethan Dettenmeyer right here on L.A. Talk Radio.